All right, if you were at my last presentation, you saw the, a brief beginning of this one, a, a teaser almost. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, post-tensioning timber bridges. Michigan's only got uh, one nail laminated timber structure that uh, the state agency owns. Our local agencies have several hundred of these uh, type bridges. Uh, my first exposure to this bridge is the uh, case study I'm going to start with. Uh, this, this type of superstructure. Uh, this is a, a bridge in Nobbin Way. That's the proper pronunciation. It's up about 45 minutes uh, west of our Mackinac Bridge up here in a rest area, uh, just along US 2. It, you know, even though it's a rest area, it's gonna see tons of uh, heavy loaded trucks uh, hauling timber back to the lower peninsula for manufacturing. This uh, specific nail laminated timber structure spans uh, 24 feet and it's comprised of uh, 2 by 12 timbers spanning that full 24 feet uh, nailed together. 2011, uh, one of our bridge inspectors was standing under the bridge when a large truck drove over it and the bridge inspector panicked because the, the bridge deflected quite a bit more than uh, they were expecting. Uh, so they decided to run a load test on it and uh, actually measure the deflections uh, uh, based on a known load. So they uh, went to their Engadine uh, garage, uh, maintenance garage, and got a water truck that could hold 2,000 gallons of water, filled it up, ran it across the truck scale so they had the axle weights. And then they went out and measured the deflections at set locations off of a string line uh, that was uh, offset from the uh, center line of the bridge. And what they recorded was a maximum deflection of uh, three quarters of an inch in a 24 inch or 24 foot span. They thought this was excessive and they thought this could be leading to um, premature uh, failure of the HMA surface from the amount of flex the bridge was having. Called me up as the structure maintenance support uh, unit supervisor and said, hey, we got this bridge. Can you give us a hand with it? And honestly, I mean, I didn't know anything about nail laminated timber superstructures at the time. So I went to my favorite research utility, Google, and I found these three reports online. And, and surprisingly, that's about all you can find on nail laminated timber superstructures online that I could find. Uh, the first report was written in 1978 by the min minister, uh, minister, the Ontario Transportation Ministry. Uh, the second one was uh, written by the US Forest Department in 1990, and then as I uh, developed uh, a repair strategy for this bridge, I consulted the glue laminated timber uh, bridge design manual. So report number one, you know, for what happens to these bridges, it kind of clearly tells us what happens to these nail laminated timber structures. Um, report number one says, uh, initially all of, your, all of your strength in your bridge comes from the tightness and the pressure between these uh, these nailed laminate timbers and getting them to work in composite action. And what happens over time is uh, freeze thaw, moisture, drying out, debris, dirt get in there and these start to back away and these get loose and they are no longer working compositely. They're working like a big set of piano keys. And that also leads to premature failure of the HMA overlay that was on it. So the Ministry of Ontario wanted to research how they could fix this because they had several hundred of these bridges in their inventory that were just exhibiting the same thing we saw in our Knobbin Way Bridge. Uh, their design goal is they wanted something that was uh, completely adjustable. They wanted something that could be easily installed by their field staff. And they also wanted something that could be uh, a fix that could be environmentally protected because they do uh, heavily salt some of these bridges. And what they landed on was a 5 8 inch diameter threaded post tensioning bars uh, top and bottom, two feet on center, all along the entire fascia of this bridge to clamp the bridge back together. They also installed on the fascia of the structure one and a half inch thick continuous steel plate. So it kind of looked like this. Here's the steel plate they were going to install. And then top and bottom, they have that five eighths inch uh, post tensioning bar that's fully threaded. And they're going to tighten these bars down and squeeze the laminates back together. And their goal of the research project they were doing was to get 150 PSI pressure on the, this face right here in between every laminate. Just briefly, the result of, of what their experiment uh, on this bridge did, this is the Hebert Creek Bridge. Uh, their post-tensioning actually shrunk their bridge in width 
uh, depending on what span it was in. It was a five span bridge, anywhere from six to 18 inches. So, I mean, that's, that was quite a shrink. I mean, but it, it had experienced quite a growth over the life of its bridge. And they also came up with the result that this reduced the deflections on their bridge, on their experimental bridge in the 1970s by 50%. And their analysis showed that it increased the strength of the bridge over what it had been uh, in the delaminated uh, form by 100%. Their recommendations was um, the bridge will continue to uh, squeeze in a little bit and that post-tensioning force will relax over time. So in the first year, um, they want to go back out and uh, retension every three months or measure the tensioning force and retension as necessary. And then every year after that, just once a year, measure the existing post-tensioning force. Research, second research project I uh, referenced uh, was written in 1990, and the funny thing about this was it was just a manual on how to uh, design basically transverse stressed post-tensioned uh, timber superstructures. And what they did as part of uh, this was they referenced the 1970s report from the Ministry of Ontario and said that that was the baseline uh, study that led them to stop doing nail laminated timber superstructures, you know, basically everywhere recommending not to do that anymore and to recommend only doing uh, post-tensioning. What's great about being able to do the post-tensioning when you're designing your uh, nail laminated superstructure, I mean your timber laminated superstructure is when you're building it fresh you can put that laminate right down the center and you don't have, I mean you can put that post-tensioning rod right down the center and you don't have to have one top and bottom exposed to the environment and the one on the top's getting you know buried in HMA and driven on. So this leads to the design of the Knobbinway structure. Like I said, the Hebert Creek Bridge shrunk 6 to 18 inches when they post-tensioned it to 150 PSI. Later in their study, they determined that they only needed to actually tighten it to 40 PSI between the laminates to get a similar result. So our goal for our bridge, um, our Knobbinway Bridge measured 24 foot 2 inches wide, and that was only 2 inches wider than the as-built. So our goal was actually just to shrink it back to about what it was before and land somewhere between 40 and 150 PSI tension between the laminates. Um, we did that with a torque wrench and what we did was we took the bars that we decided to use into our laboratory and equated a torque value on the wrench to a tension force in the rod so we knew how much torque we needed in the field um, to be applied to get that force in the uh, in the laminates. But I also like kind of belt and suspenders kind of things because I was hesitant to fully, you know, fully trust this method all by itself. So I, I looked at the glue laminated timber bridge design manual. They do spreader beams on the bottom of the bridges a lot. And so what I did was not only did I squeeze it back together, but then I locked it in place by adding spreader beams bolted through the deck. So as a belt and suspender kind of guarantee that it's not gonna, you know, back out any time in the future. So the final design here in elevation, we've got these uh, channels that we attach to the fascia. We've got our, what we use were M8 bars, top and bottom. And then we've got these uh, glue laminated timber spreader beams uh, bolted through the deck on the bottom. And it was, a, it was a gorgeous view right here. It's right on Lake Michigan. I just like to throw that picture in. Uh, but our construction team to do, to implement this, consisted of uh, the structure maintenance support unit that I supervise, our statewide steel bridge repair crew in Michigan, and our St. Ignace uh, bridge maintenance garage. And for those of you who don't know, St. Ignace is the name of the city on the other side of the Mackinac Bridge. So this was Monday. I'm gonna go through this project real quick. The local MDOT office did not want us to remove the HMA overlay for some reason. So you can see we're laying out here where we're gonna have our bars and where we're gonna have our spreader beams because the spreader beams had to be bolted through the deck. Here we are just removing some of the concrete and now we're installing some of the bars. Had to drill through the curb. This is just, this is just a timber curb that we're drilling through. And over here, they're drilling holes in the channels because we wanted to uh, lag bolt the channels to the fascia uh, just for construction purposes. Here we are wrestling the channels into place and you can see the lag bolts here that we had temporarily attached to the fascia of the bridge so that we can install these M8 bars. These M8 bars weren't long enough to go the full length of the bridge, so they had to be mechanically uh, coupled together, which is one of the things I didn't like about them. But at the time, it was the only threaded bar I could find online to, to purchase. 
So here's an aerial view. You can see the you can see some of the bolts drilled in right here for the spreader beams, and you can see the M8 bars we've got in here and the couples. And we slid the M8 bars into a uh, we greased them when we slid them into a sleeve to try and protect them from the HMA. And here's just a zoom in on the uh, the couples and the uh, the sleeves. And here we are. This is the same torque torque wrench we used um, at the laboratory, so it was the exact same one. To, that we used to uh, tighten in the field then. These glue lambs were pretty heavy, so it was kind of a, had to almost go into beast mode to get these things up against the bridge deck. And that's what it looked like in the end. You can see all of the laminated timber beams. You can see the bars on the bottom. And this is only Tuesday, by the way, so we're almost done with the project. We started Monday and this is Tuesday, so it's a pretty fast moving project. And we did the load test on Tuesday as well. Got the exact same water truck, put 2,000 gallons of water in it again, put in a string line and measured it, uh, actually put the, the truck in the exact same locations that it had been in and got it, uh, ran it across the truck scale so we knew the axle weights were about the same as they were in the previous load test. And the result was we went from uh, three quarter inch max deflection to uh, quarter inch max deflection. We ended up with having really good results. And then Wednesday came and the MDOT office is like, yeah, why don't you guys go ahead and, you know, replace the overlay anyways. <laughs> when you're in maintenance, you just have to learn how to roll with it. Um, one thing I left off is we did, we were able to shrink the bridge from 24.2 wide down to 23.11. So right in that area we wanted it to be in. So once we had already, you know, Swiss cheese the deck, it was pretty easy to get these panels up. Uh, we used this product here uh, in order to, as a waterproofing membrane for timber, it kind of goes on like fudge. You gotta, it, it, it's really difficult to work with, but um, it got the job done. And we wanted a little extra added uh, protection. This is just uh, another waterproofing uh, rolled on membrane over our bars. So now our bars are, you know, they are in a sleeve with waterproofing membrane over them before we put the HMA down. And it's still holding up really nice. There's a little bit of reflective cracking above where all the bars are at, which I was expecting. But that's it, the, the, the deck has held up beautifully for the last uh, six years. So, and there's the finished product. We put a fresh coat of paint on the, uh, on the channels, and there's the finished uh, HMA. And I wanted to fast forward six years from that. Um, in 2017, I was asked to give uh, a presentation at our annual LTAP bridge training conference. Um, I was actually asked to come in. I had to train our uh, local agencies on bridge maintenance, and I gave part of this presentation as a because I knew there was a lot of local agencies that had this type of superstructure out there that might be facing this problem. Lo and behold, St. Joe County Road Commission called me up a couple months later and said, hey, we've got 55 of these and they're exhibiting similar problems. Can you give us a hand on doing one so we get the hang of it? We went out there and you can see on this bridge, they, they were all in right from the beginning. They, wanted, they took off the HMA overlay and started cleaning the deck surface right away from the beginning. And you can see how much separation there was in some of these, in, in between some of these laminates here. And they did, a, they did their own load test and got three quarter inch deflection on uh, one of the spans that they did. Now, the one design change I made, like I said, I had to couple those M7 bars together. And uh, I didn't like that because the couple had a big profile that would eat into the HMA overlay. And I found a company in Michigan that threads uh, grade 36 rebar. So I was able to get um, continuous bar all the way across the, uh, all the way across the deck without having to couple anything. So that, that was a really good design change, I thought. And also I like the fact that they didn't change their mind halfway through and you know, on the HMA overlay, they just took it off right away. And we got a similar result. Here's the final finished product. They used uh, the same channels we used you know, um, I gave them the, the, I designed the bar size for them, gave them a hand in procuring it, and then they had three quarters inch deflection before. Their bridge width shrunk six inches, and uh, they had eighth inch deflection after. Did you have any kind of uh, provisions for after the project was done, for the next time they go and repave that bridge deck? Specifically talking about bringing out a roto mill and avoiding all of the, uh, the bolts and rods. No, I mean, the, the, the local MDOT office knows it's in there. So, I mean, the next time they decide to do it, I'm, I'm sure they'll add a provision. 
Jason, uh, were you, um, uh, was part of your process load rating before and after uh, these actions, or was that not part of it? We were trying to get serviceability and not necessarily load rating. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.